Welcome to my talk. It will be about confidential computing and the role of SUSE uh, in, in this area. I hope that I will be over the course of the talk uh, make you excited about this topic and actually make you want it uh, for your future deployments. So just a briefly about myself. My name is Wojciech Pavlik. I am the general manager of uh, SUSE's business critical Linux group. Um, so heading much of uh, SUSE's uh, Linux engineering um, and business. And as such, as being a general manager, it means that I'll be mostly presenting the work of others, but um, I'm glad that I can because it's pretty awesome. And to introduce you to confidential computing, right? Uh, so we did a little bit of a research asking people, so uh, would you actually be worried in case uh, a cloud provider for your instances that you are running in the cloud would have access to your data? And the overwhelming answer, like what is it, 82% uh, was yes, we would be worried. And well, this is kind of surprising because, you know, the cloud provider actually does have the access. So people should be worried uh, if they feel that they need to be worried in such a case. And the cloud provider obviously does not have any uh, reasons why to access that data, and actually most of them are building significant uh, infrastructure internally and regulations to prevent unauthorized access to customer data, but still technically there is the possibility. And this is one of the things that confidential computing is solving. Also, 94% uh, of customers are willing to invest into uh, security of their data in the cloud and elsewhere beyond what the regulations require, which is great because again, this is clearly indicating that uh, customers are willing to look into new technologies for security and confidential computing is one of those. Obviously, uh, when we come to that, um, the willingness to invest is there, but there is also an expectation that, well, this will be easy. And so that's what, where we are going with confidential computing, we are trying to make it really easy to consume. So what it is about, it is all about data in use. Uh, when you are running a system, um, most people today would not give a second thought about encrypting data on the network, right? In the early days of the internet, everything was going on plain text and actually almost human readable, even like major protocols like uh, SMTP or, or HTTP were designed to be human, re human readable, right? So. Um, people would just send packets open over the network. Nobody does that today. And, and even just suggesting that somebody should use HTTP instead of HTTPS is considered almost insane. So everybody is just encrypting data over the network. Uh, the same thing is happening with uh, data in storage. So if you look at your own phone, uh, then you will probably know that some years ago, the uh, internal flash of the phones was also unencrypted, but today every single phone manufacturer is encrypting the data in the phone uh, by default, such that when it's lost, it's not easily retrievable by somebody that has phone to phone. Uh, so the remaining state of data that actually we have not looked at uh, is data in use. So data that is residing in the computers or phones or anything operating memory, right, the RAM, uh, the DIMMs themselves. And that is still a uh, potential avenue to, to attack, a, a, a vector, where um, contents of the RAM in clear text are accessible either by snooping the bus or uh, by dumping the computer in liquid nitrogen, while well, that's a little bit more advanced technique, uh, and then pulling the memory out because when it's so cold, uh, the RAM, the dynamic RAM, does not lose the contents and you can then read it off. Um, so that's what we'll be talking about, figuring out how to encrypt the data in memory. And that is not an easy task because obviously you can't operate on unencrypted data because it's encrypted. There are some uh, theoretical studies on how to do that, but they are more on the crazy fringes of mathematics. So there are two implementations that are interesting 
for us in this respect, and that is AMD SEV and Intel TDX. So how does it work? Um, it is actually pretty simple. There is an encryption engine that sits uh, in between uh, the memory access module on the CPU and the actual physical memory. It is using AES, the industry standard um, block cipher, uh, to actually encrypt the data as it goes uh, between the memory and the CPU. So the CPU caches are not encrypted, but the memory is. And you can already see that this means that inside of the CPU and the CPU die, the data is unencrypted, and but at the moment, at least, it tries to leave the CPU, it gets encrypted in the memory. That certainly prevents uh, any attack that would be using, um, like physically monitoring the bus or uh, physically getting at the memory contents. There is also, uh, quite obviously, a performance hit, because uh, every time uh, the data goes from or to the main system memory, there is an additional latency of a couple nanoseconds uh, for the encryption and decryption. But fortunately, that is not a huge system impact uh, because compared to the CPU, the memory is already very slow, and so most of the immediate data interactions happen in the caches. Um, chips are available today from Intel, ARM, AMD, and even IBM. Um, but not all of them are in the mass market at the moment. Uh, AMD has been there for quite a while. Intel uh, is coming to the mass market this fall with the Emerald Rapids chipsets. Now, people have been talking about confidential computing for ages. And that is also why a lot of companies are kind of tired of it uh, and do not pay a lot of interest. Uh, the first iteration actually was in 2008, where uh, Intel did introduce loadable applets in the CSME, in the management engine uh, of, of the CPUs. It's a small processor that actually is embedded in the CPU that is handling the uh, management and has been a, a center of a couple controversies, as you, have been, you, may, you may, may have seen in the news. So Intel actually impl in implemented a technology where you could run your security critical code on the management CPU uh, after ver being verified by a proprietary algorithm, which was pretty secure, but also not very useful because only very small snippets of code could run, maybe something for a banking application. Um, there was a complementary technology called Intel Secure Display that would then allow a secure way to uh, put the content of that on the screen, like for pin entry or similar. But uh, given that the use cases were so limited, this never really caught on. So later, uh, we see Intel trying again with SGX in 2015, uh, and that is a lot cooler. Uh, it actually does encrypt main memory. It does pr allow for a large application, even a possibly a complete container to run uh, encrypted. But it has significant limitations. So again, useful for um, very critical data processing that must not be seen by other processes or other applications or other containers. But the main limitation is that although two applications would not be able to see each other memory, even if they bypass some of the restrictions that the CPU is putting on not allowing that access, um, they still share a common kernel. And that kernel is what is trying to separate them, what is trying to enforce the separation. So if one application manages to somehow get control of the kernel, because it's actually a hacker running an exploit, well, then there is no protection from the encryption to the other application, because once you got the kernel, you get everything. And that's where the latest generation of technologies, AMD, SEV, SNP, Intel, TDX, or ARM CCA uh, actually differ. They implement uh, the separation at the uh, virtual machine level. And the main difference is that this separation is enforced fully by the CPU. It does not require the hypervisor to actually do it. So the hypervisor itself, and that is the beauty of it, is outside of trust zone. So the hypervisor even then when compromised, is actually not able to access the contents of the VMs. And that gets us to uh, the 
analysis of possible hardware attacks or possible attacks on, on AVM that this is designed to protect against. So the first one that we see here is actually a physical attack. So somebody gets a, their hands on a server that is running a critical workload in a virtual machine and are trying to get the secrets that are inside. So they employ a, um, I don't know, a bus analyzer, uh, a high speed uh, device that usually I, they are, those are quite expensive um, and is sampling what is on the bus or actually uh, then using the liquid nitrogen method that I dis uh, explained earlier to get the contents of the memory, that is certainly protecting against that. So um, one of the things that, that comes here into play is that we are trying to get the data uh, limited to just the CPU die, right? Because the die, the silicon itself, is really hard to examine first on modern CPUs. It's actually um, flipped upside down so that all the actual active content is glued onto uh, the substrate. So really getting at it requires or oh, well, disassembling the whole CPU and just extracting the die and then connecting it, which usually just damages it beyond repair. But also you would need something like an atomic force microscope to actually observe the data that is, that is live on the CPU. So that would require a significant research lab to just implement that kind of attack. So we are trying to limit the, uh, the, the, uh, the plain text data to stay just in the die. Uh, this technology helps us to um, encrypt it when it goes to memory, um, but data actually needs to get off the chip also to the disk and to the network, and that encryption happens in software on the CPU itself, right? So th through the software encryption and this hardware accelerated encryption, we can make sure that uh, any data that exists in clear text exists only on the CPU. So that is sorted. The typical application for this uh, would be when really uh, machines are in a uh, hostile environment where something like this can be expected. Um, there is one way how to get through, however, and that's been documented in a few research papers, um, but is not really quite that practical, and new CPUs are actually fixing that. Uh, so the new silicon revisions are taking this uh, attack into account, and it's voltage glitching. So most processors, most electronic components do not react very happily uh, to disturbances in their power, right? So if, if a CPU is in executing an instruction and suddenly uh, the voltage that is powering the CPU drops, then it actually may interpret a zero as a one or vice versa in that calculation. Simply because it's comparing the voltages uh, in its internal memory to the voltage of the power supply, and suddenly if they flip and they are uh, the other way around, well, then it actually inst executes the instructions wrong. And this is an attack that can be applied to the internal security engine inside of um, a modern processor, uh, which then allows to extract and reveal the internal keys, and basically um, the nut is cracked, the, the secrets are spilled, there is nothing more to do. Uh, the, 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 the fix is actually pretty easy. Um, most uh, embedded CPUs have something that's called brownout detection. So they have a circuit that is monitoring the voltage um, at very high speed, and as soon as it sees a glitch, the whole CPU is reset into default state, so like rebooted, uh, and that means that the attack cannot progress. Uh, because a CPU requires a stable voltage, as soon as the voltage is unstable, it really should just give up. That is one way. The other way is like Im embedding included or including embedded um, capacitors and diodes that make sure that uh, any energy that went into the CPU can, uh, can get over such instructions and um, not be siphoned out anymore. So uh, this attack is currently possible with some of the existing CPUs, uh, but mainly desktop CPUs. It will be rectified in the future. And um, even then, it is actually this on the picture on the, on the left is a picture of how to do it, right? It requires opening up the, 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 the machine and then spending several hours tuning that attack such that the voltage glitch happens exactly at the right instruction in the uh, security processor's 
firmware such that it hits exactly the condition that then skips the security checks. So not very practical for, um, let's say, attacking um, something very quickly or remotely. You need to have full physical access, and it will be rectified. So, but there are many more interesting uses that do not uh, require um, physical access. And the number one is an attack against a compromised hypervisor. So because a hypervisor can be compromised remotely, this is a, something that is much more likely to happen. Uh, when a hypervisor has a vulnerability where uh, an input from a VM can actually allow to take it over, uh, then this technology will prevent from the hypervisor from going back down into the other VM because the hypervisor does not have access to its memory. It could overwrite it for sure, right? It could just write into their memory because the hypervisor has full access to the machine. But then um, because the, uh, the uh, VM expects the memory to be encrypted, a block of zeros or whatever data that the hypervisor would put in would be decrypted into garbage and it would just crash. So it's not a protection of the VM against crashing, but it's certainly a protection against infiltrating or exfiltrating any kind of data from the VM. So one interesting part is that caches cannot be encrypted because it would be a too massive slowdown. Uh, caches needs to be accessed within a few cycles of the CPU but they are each tagged with the encryption ID. So you can have multiple VMs running on a system and each has, has its own encryption key for the memory. And so the cache lines in the CPU are tagged with that ID such that access to that cache line from a VM that has not uh, caused that cache line to be filled uh, is um, resulting in a cache miss such that the, the VM does not see that cache line. The same for hypervisor. If it tries to read uh, something that is cached but with the wrong ID, it just sees a cache mess and it tries to fetch it from the main memory, gets it encrypted, doesn't see the content. So this way uh, we can actually ensure uh, that, um, that the hypervisor cannot go into our VM. We may still lose its contents, uh, but we will know that the contents will not be tampered with or that the attacker will not get what is inside. Now, the even more interesting use case is actually a protection against a rogue, hyper, uh, rogue hypervisor administrator. So you may be running your workloads in the cloud or uh, at an MSP or at a, a data center where there is a 24 by 7 um, service monitoring your machines. And a administrator may try I don't know, be bribed or something to access your data. And this is the same case as the last one. There's really not much difference, uh, except that this is always an option, right? Somebody that has rights to the hypervisor today has all rights to all the VMs that are running under that hypervisor. So um, the technology that prevents a compromised hypervisor from uh, accessing the data in the VM as well protects against the administrator of such a hypervisor. And this is actually quite beautiful because that uh, means that you can put your data into the cloud and trust that nobody can see it. Now, just encrypting the data is not enough um, because you could potentially upload your VM image into the hypervisor, uh, sorry, into the, in, into the cloud um, ask the cloud to run it, but the cloud could either modify your image before it puts it into this um, secured, confidential, encrypted state, um, or just emulate the CPU. If you have a emulated fake CPU that does not really implement the encryption, but it just tells you that it's encrypting, well, then you, you, all your protections would be, again, in vain. And so we need a proof, right? We need a proof from the CPU that the image is running encrypted in the uh, confidential computing mode and that it is running unmodified. And the question is, how do we do that? And the answer is a remote attestation. How does remote attestation work? And this is really the magic of the whole technology. Um, 
you upload an image, um, the hypervisor puts, allocates memory for it, puts the image in the memory, and then the image starts, and the image asks the security processor inside of the CPU, dear security processor, please attest me. And what the security processor does, it looks at the memory contents and calculates a hash, a cryptographically secure hash of the memory. It looks at the register contents and calculates a hash of the register contents, and then signs those hashes with its own embedded key that has been put in by the manufacturer of the CPU. Um, again, a asymmetrical signature that is, that is then put there. Uh, this signed hashes, this is called the attestation report, and that then goes and is sent to you, to the owner of the machine, to um, the administrator of the VM that wants to run that VM. And you can then check, well, this hash matches my image. This register hash matches the expected state of registers at the start of the image or at the actual, actual moment that it's asking for that attestation. And because it's signed, and that signature or that key that signed it is actually signed by AMD or Intel or uh, whatever manufacturer of the CPU. This is telling me that it's exactly the image that should be running and that is running encrypted and that the hypervisor did not modify the image, did properly enable the encryption, uh, encrypted mode and could not have access to the contents. And from now on, the VM I know uh, is the right VM and is running in a mode where the hypervisor no longer has access. That is cool, but it's also somewhat impractical. And so that gets us to the next slide. Uh, current software is not supporting this mode. Um, using a new hash, using, uh, while well, calculating the hash for the whole VM, uh, and the VM may actually be changing over time if it is stateful, if it actually has some configuration, the hash will maybe always different every time it started. Uh, that's impractical. So the easiest way how to take it from here to an actual practical state is using Trusted Boot. Trusted Boot has been around for quite a while. It is using a TPM to, again, measure individual stages of boot. Um, and so if we just could have a virtual TPM that is running inside of our VM uh, that is providing these services like the Trusted Boot needs, well, then we would have a solution to the problem. We would have something that is connecting the confidential computing, the SEV, SNP, and the TDX technologies to our own uh, old known uh, Trusted Boot. And so if we can get that piece of glue, uh, then we have a full solution that works with existing software and provides what we were asking for, and that is the confidential computing. There is such a piece of software, and actually SUSE has implemented it. It's called Coconut, uh, Coco for confidential computing. SVSM is for um, uh, secure VM services module, something like that. Um, secure VM services, yeah, second VM service module. It's, it's, it was written by Jörg Gretel, um, big thanks to him. Uh, he is the reason why I can have this talk, uh, because he has not just implemented this, but also a number of other components for conventional computing in the Linux kernel. Um, it is now the default and uh, standard part of the solution, um, taking over even uh, other implementations. And what it does, it attests, it's, it's written in Rust, it attests itself using the service processor. Um, and then creates a, a virtual TPM, Trusted Platform Module, using the on-chip uh, FTPM or firmware TPM, and then provides those services in, uh, to, to, to the operating system. It is running as a paravisor, so it actually runs in VMPL zero, so the privilege level zero, and runs the operating system then in VMPL one, and so it isolates the operating system from itself. So the trust part is limited to a fairly small amount of very carefully tested and reviewed code. 
and then the operating system, even if that, that gets compromised, cannot compromise our code corner. So it's just another level of, of security in there. Um, one thing, one more component that we need uh, to complete the whole picture is the remote attestation server. So a machine that uh, can talk to uh, Coconut and ask, okay, who you are, give me your attestation report, I will validate it. And that is Keylime. It's uh, a solution that was developed primarily for uh, the standard trusted boot, but can be just as well applied in this case because, again, we have converted the case of confidential computing into a trusted boot scenario uh, using, using Coconut. So it is actually more extensive than just the validation. It is then using also runtime monitoring using IMA. Um, of course, we would be using encrypted disk, uh, full disk encryption uh, via TPM, which is also something that is now available in Linux product, uh, in SUSE's products and has a full revocation framework for keys and what else. So this is what completes the recipe. With this, we can have a fully attested, fully confidential machine uh, running anywhere. And uh, this is then what I call a on-premise equivalent privacy, right? So your VM is as secure as if it would be running, well, in your basement. If you want to try any of this, uh, SUSE is uh, releasing regularly, uh, every three months, a release of our next generation Linux product. Um, it is both available in its open source variant, open source, open SUSE variant, community variant, and uh, currently also freely as the enterprise version. Uh, the latest prototype that was released in March, and we will be releasing another one soonish, uh, is called Pis Bernina and includes all these technologies in it. So if you are looking at testing them yourself, download Pis Bernina and uh, feel free to play with it. Again, uh, SUSE will continue dropping more code uh, and more complete implementations of this. Um, and we'll be very happy for any feedback. Now, there is much to do. This is not a complete stack yet. So number one, the CPUs are still missing, right? So AMD has been on it for a while. Since 2021, there are CPUs on the market from AMD that support this, but they are still not all that widely deployed. When it comes to Intel, um, the current uh, Sapphire Rapids CPUs do have an experimental microcode that enables this functionality, but I doubt that will become available widely. Uh, only the Emerald Rapids coming this fall will have it. So we are talking about really um, software implementation that is ahead of the actual availability of the hardware. Nevertheless, even on software end, there is a number of things that still need to get done. And one of them is that um, KVM is still missing support for SCVSNP. Uh, so we do support SCVSNP as a guest, uh, but not as a host yet in the Linux kernel. Um, and that is depending on specific patches that um, enable, and I will not go into the details here, uh, enable specific aspects of memory management to actually enable that. And this is also what is currently blocking Intel TDX support in the Linux kernel. But I'm quite sure that this will be resolved rather sooner than later and that both those technologies will get uh, fully implemented into mainline. Currently they exist only as out of three patches. Um, there is also uh, somewhat missing support uh, by some of the major cloud providers. Um, AWS and Google Cloud are using KVM or sort of KVM because what is AWS is using is today called micro, uh, sorry, Nitro, uh, but it is still originally based on KVM and so they are hit by this missing support. Um, Microsoft Azure actually is using their own little paravisor and that is currently having full support for SEVSNP, so that would be the place to test this technology. Um, if you want to test in AWS, there are reset instances with uh, the Ap AMD EPIC processors, uh, somewhat more expensive than pay as you go instances, but at least uh, the, uh, the, the uh, Amazon Nitro hardware is not blocking anybody there from, from trying this. 
So we will, of course, as soon as I continue working with all those cloud providers, making sure that the technology is fully available and enabled in our products such that this can be uh, properly used uh, and looking towards like end of the year time frame to put all the pieces together. Now, I was talking quite a bit about how this protects the user from the, from the cloud provider, right? So as if the cloud providers were evil. Of course, they are not. And so the question is, should a cloud provider care about confidential computing? Well, yes, because um, when I'm saying that the technology protects a cloud provider, or sorry, a, a user from the cloud provider, that also means that this is a benefit for the cloud provider. They have a, an additional technology that protects their customers from anything that can go wrong on their end, right? A, again, rogue employee or um, even a, um, even legally they are actually giving, or they're actually being relieved of the liability of what is running on the customer system if they have no access, right? So. Uh, that is actually quite a big win that the um, cloud provider no longer has to care what the customer has on the system because they will never see it. Um, what also is important is that this brings potential additional customers to the cloud provider or to the MSP. Uh, customers like um, banks, any enterprise that is actually, um, you, or that, that, that is managing uh, personal data under European GDPR directives or equivalents. Um, it is not possible to transfer the data to other uh, countries, other legislations, and so limits the ability to process them in the cloud. Banking industries, uh, trade secrets, uh, card processing, what else? Uh, any regulated market actually has trouble moving into the cloud and this enables that. Uh, even a customer like SUSE uh, currently uh, would uh, be enabled by this to move to the cloud. So they cannot uh, currently use, uh, process our code when we are compiling the distribution uh, in the cloud because we have a certification called Common Criteria EL4 Plus um, that prevents us from using that because uh, somebody on the way could modify the code, introduce backdoors or what else, uh, find out about vulnerabilities. And so we have to process on premise. Again, this technology would given that we will be able to prove that at any point in time, uh, the code was always encrypted and not ac accessible by any third party would allow us to do that. So could be a major business enabler. What it means for the edge, right? Um, that's back from the hypervisor to, um, to the physical security. If you are, uh, if, you, if you have your service, if you are a telco, uh, and have your service at the curb of a street streaming videos to uh, the houses in the neighborhood, um, or uh, you are a um, restaurant chain where uh, you have small Kubernetes cluster in every restaurant, uh, those places can be considered hostile environments where somebody may be interested in actually tampering with your system, making sure that they get all the streams of the video for free or whatever. Uh, and so this is actually a very nice way how to do that because you can take off the shelf hardware and actually run something on it that you know that it's exactly what you want to run untempered with and um, even though there is no specific modification in hardware to enable extra security. Now, given that we are at the open source summit, uh, I need to ask myself the question of devoization. So as probably everybody knows, GPLv3 was created exactly to combat a situation where somebody using cryptography or additional security measures prevents um, modifications to the software that, uh, that is running on a device that is based on open source but still completely locked down um, because um, like the vendor does not want that device to be tempered with. Uh, a typical example, or the first example that actually uh, caused this to be called TiVoization was the TiVo uh, video recorder that uh, would not allow users, although its firmware was, mod was fully open source based, 
modify that firmware and potentially fix bugs or improve it. So simply that would mean that if you would modify the firmware, it would just break itself. The device would be a paperweight. Uh, the nice thing about solving this exact problem, so I am actually delivering a service and I absolutely need to make sure that that service is being delivered um, by my uh, business uh, without somebody being able to tamper with the service. Could be uh, maybe a device in a car that actually needs to pass all the certifications uh, such that it is safe and does not kill people um, or something similar. So I need to deliver that service, um, and I need this level of protection, and confidential computing will give it to me. But at the same time, it will allow a user to actually replace my VM with something completely different, um, and the device would still continue functioning. So given that the protection is only given to an ephemeral temporary VM in the system, I can use the hardware for anything else once my serv once it's no longer being used for my service. So from a operating, uh, from an open source kind of ethos, this is actually a much, much better solution than locking down the bootloader and the firmware. So I hope that you have enjoyed uh, the talk. I think I'm mostly on time. Uh, and I will be just closing with uh, the question, so why would we be using this, right? And the answer is really why you wouldn't, <laughs> because the same way that everybody is encrypting um, network today, everybody is encrypting drive today, uh, well, eventually it is quite likely that everybody will be encrypting the memory, just because it is giving an additional layer of protection without almost any drawbacks. So you will want to have your memory encrypted, you will want to have uh, well, many people will want to have compliance uh, with, uh, with regulations. Uh, we are striving to make it really zero effort such that the operating system potentially may be even completely agnostic of, of this as long as it supports uh, trusted boot. Um, so I hope that um, my talk made it an interesting. Um, oh, sorry, my talk made, made you actually be interested in this technology and consider it in the future. And thanks. Please. Yes, so uh, with the potential impact of IMA notebooks, um, and there is what, a, a hopefully relatively percentage overhead in the AMMDB or VM. Right. So it would be a multiplicative effect, right? So if, if you lose a certain percentage because of IMA and certain percentage of this extra. Not at the moment. Plus, you actually do not require IMA to run this, right? So it, it, I mean, if, if you run IMA, it gives you an additional layer of protection for runtime, but, um, but uh, confidential computing is useful even without IMA. Right. So, so there, is, there is one more source of potential uh, performance impact um, that I did not mention so far, and that is that um, given that you want to have all your disk encryption and all your network encryption happen on the CPU die, you can't offload it to a network card or to an I.O. card, because then you would have the data going over the PCI Express bus uh, completely unencrypted. So we are watching the space, but, uh, but of course, um, well, not majorly involved in coding up anything yet, right? Um, there is another, th there are like two avenues to solve this. One is to actually have uh, encryption on the PCI Express bus, 
into the card. The other is having uh, the encryption acceleration on the CPU. And both are being developed in the hardware industry, right? So um, I guess eventually we will support both, but yes. Yes, because because um, if you are actually if you would be today combining confidential computing with that, you would not have a solution. True, true. But still, even many of the models are hugely benefiting from running on a, on a GPU. But uh, so then you would actually be sending plain text data over over the PCI Express bus, which is not great, yeah. Certainly not for this model, not for this threat model. So we have Keylime as a part of the distribution, and we I believe made some contributions already, but not a huge amount yet. Because from our point of view, that is one of the more functionally complete parts of this whole puzzle. Uh, <laughs> and some of the other parts needed a lot more attention. You want to answer? <laughs> yep. Well, actually, I was talking to, uh, to uh, IWS just last week in Berlin, and Nitro actually does not really uh, get in the way of confidential computing, let's say that way, right? So they will be able to enable it. Okay, so assuming, assuming you've got a, uh, a confidential VM, which is based in SCVSMP or CDS or CCA when that comes along, right? it's, the, it's the remote application of Project Yeah. Yeah. That, that's the point, right? Uh, when you are doing the remote attestation, it's the VM asking, actually it's, it's, it's the coconut component in the VM that is running at VMPL0, asking through the hypervisor to the security processor, please attest me. Yes, yes, that is the idea. And then, of course, the system can use that to talk to the attestation server, validate itself, establish uh, HTTPS communication, SSH keys, and so on, that are based on this, uh, this, this exchange, and then be security, securely identified by anybody connecting to it that it is exactly what we wanted to have. It is provided the keys to unlock the storage as well during the boot process, so that it doesn't have to contain them, uh, and so on. No, fine. <laughs> I'm, I'm <laughs> cool. Again, thank you all. <laughs>